Hi, Kristen. Hey, it's great to be here. Um, how are you? Good, good. You can see the lines under the eyes. We just had a baby girl, and so oh, uh, the, the nights are... <laughs> the nights are... <laughs> Thank you. Great. So, um, so you have great projects. <laughs> Definitely. Awesome. Uh, so welcome to the show. Thank you for being here and taking the time with us. It's a, it's a great privilege uh, to have you. Um, please give us some perspective, some, some feedback about yourself. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I grew up in, in Heidelberg and, uh, you know, I used to be that kid who, um, you know, was kicked out of high school, had to repeat a year probably held the unofficial world record of how many dustbins you can knock over on your way to school when you're driving. And then one day wasn't so lucky anymore. And I crashed into four parked cars, all cars completely destroyed, including my own. And I won't forget the policeman who came to the scene and he was like, oh my God, he's still alive. And so what stuck with me, you know, what the, was the, those questions that came after was like, oh, was I supposed to be dead? And if I was supposed to be dead, who would have come to my funeral? Who would have actually cared? Was it all worth it? And at that point, I only had, you know, depressing answers. And so uh, it took me on this intense search for meaning. And I started reading a book that's highly recommended, uh, Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, which is all about yeah. how do we find meaning in tough situations. And what I realized is where I find meaning is connecting ideas, connecting people, and, and the sparks that come from that when you do it. And so it took me on a journey as community builder, entrepreneur, social entrepreneur, and then later into academia. And what I found fascinating on this journey is that the most successful purpose-driven people that we studied, that I worked with, they seem to have something in common, which is that they intuitively cultivate serendipity. They somehow have the ability to turn the unexpected into positive outcomes. And so I got really fascinated by this question, is there a science-based framework for this? Is there a way that we can learn from all these different stories around the world and put a pattern behind it so that we can all learn it and have more of it? And so that's kind of my key excitement at the moment is the question of what is the kind of mindset that allows us in this fast changing world where, you know, to your point, you obviously do great work around the question of how do we in a way develop sustainable solutions, right? In a world that, that needs that more than ever, what is the kind of a mindset we need for this that allows us to connect the dots and, and make it happen? So that's my key focus at, at the moment. Amazing, amazing. Congratulations on the great work, first of all. Um, it's, uh, it's impressive. And, and would you mind providing us with, you know, some definition about serendipity? Um, what do we need to understand over there? Yeah, well, it's interesting, right? Because usually when we think about luck and, yeah. and related concepts, we think about something that just happens to us, right? So something that's passive, something that just falls into our laps. And that's where a lot of societal inequality comes from, right? That's where people get born into good versus not so good families and things like this. That's very different from serendipity, which is about smart luck. It's about the luck we create ourselves based on our own actions on how we react to the unexpected. So to give you an example, um, you know, imagine you are in a coffee shop and you have erratic hand movements like I do. So you spill a lot of coffee, right? So imagine you spill coffee over someone uh, next to you and that person looks at you a little bit annoyedly, but you sense there might be something there. You don't know what it is. You just sense there might be something there. And now you have two options, right? Option number one is to say, I'm so sorry, you walk outside and you think, ah, what could have happened had I spoken with a person? Option number two, you start a conversation, that person turns out to become the love of your life, your co-founder, your next business partner, you name it. The point is our reaction to the unexpected moment, us making the moment meaningful, the accident meaningful, that's what creates the serendipity in the end. And so, you know, in our work, we look a lot into how do social innovations happen? How do innovations happen? And up to 50% of them happen serendipitously where someone sees something in a moment that went wrong or that kind of was unexpected and then they connect the dots and do something with it. And actually what my, my absolute favorite at the moment is the potato washing machine where, you know, a couple of years ago, a company in China uh, called Hire, they receive calls from farmers and, you know, that company produces washing machines and refrigerators and, and yeah. all these kind of things. And they receive calls from farmers and the farmers told them, your crappy washing machine is always breaking down. Well, why is it breaking down? Well, we're trying to wash our potatoes in it and it doesn't seem to work. So what would we usually say? We'll probably try to educate them and, and, and say, well, don't wash your potatoes in a, in a clothes washing machine. It's not made for that, right? It's made for clothes. They did the opposite. They said, you know what? That's unexpected. But there's probably a lot of farmers in China who might have a similar problem. 
So why don't we build in a dirt filter and make it a potato washing machine? And that's how the potato washing machine became a product. And again, that's how a lot of times innovations and interventions emerge because people are ready for the unexpected, connect the dots and then turn it into positive outcomes. I call it innovation by accident. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Uh, great, great. Thank you so much. It's, uh, it's refreshing. Um, how do you think that sustain, uh, sorry, serendipity is important to, to leaders? Uh, today, because we're in such uncertain times, and as you mentioned, we have conflict, uh, everything stumble upon. It's like, what's going on with the in, in the world overall? Yeah, well, it's interesting. I think there's two pieces to it. One is the kind of problems we need to solve, right? Think about things like climate change, societal inequality. Those kind of problems are so complex that a lot of the solutions to those problems will emerge unexpectedly. We, we will not be able to plan that for the next 50 years. We will, have, we will need to have stakeholder coalitions and so that will over time have to adjust to whatever um, is the solution that makes the most sense. And so we need some kind of mindset that allows us to tackle those complex challenges. So it's kind of, one is on the, on the, on the, on the, on the kind of level of the problem. And then the other one is really more the kind of mindset uh, in itself, like what allows us as leaders psychologically to navigate a world that is really scary, right? It's a scary world out there. It's a world that is so uncertain and, and so many things are happening. And so, you know, we just finished a study with over 40 uh, purpose-driven CEOs. So, you know, CEOs of big companies like MasterCard and, and, and others who want to become more sustainable, who want to become more purpose-driven. And we try to understand those CEOs, what makes them really successful if they really made something happen that is more towards sustainability and purpose? And so one of the key themes that's coming out of it is that they're extremely good at saying, here's a sense of direction. So if I'm MasterCard, instead of just being a payments company, now I want to bring 500 million people who previously were unbanked into the financial system. And that now is our North Star. That is kind of a bigger purpose where we're going towards. But at the same time, when I'm the CEO now of MasterCard, Here's an approximate strategy, but I know already that unexpected information will come and we will have to adjust the strategy and that has to be part of the plan. And so what I found fascinating about those CEOs is that, you know, without them knowing it a lot of times, when they articulated what they do is they cultivate serendipity all the time, because what they do is they create a culture where they give you a sense of direction and then they say, here's the strategy, but I want you to bring in unexpected information as it comes up. And that's not a threat to my authority. That's actually part of our plan. And so they make that part of the, and, and you know, Tom Lineberger said it nicely. Um, he's the CEO of Cummins, which is a, a large US company. And he said, look, cultivating serendipity is the only leadership style in times of uncertainty, because at, at the end of the day, you can pretend that you know everything. You can pretend you can plan everything. Nobody believes you. That will lead to a, a failure in trust of leadership. And so that is a much more honest way to actually articulate uh, challenges in, in the world. This is so accurate and thank you for this because, you know, we just had more than a couple of years of COVID, uh, a lot of unexpected uh, things happening all around and it's still going on and we see it now with the crisis and with the war. How, how, do, we, how do we build that? What do we need, you know, as a leader, an entrepreneur, founder, whoever, uh, you name it, but what, what types of tools and, and, and thinking uh, to approach and to, and to adopt some, because I, I believe that it's not natural. We need to build it by the core, so. Yeah, it's a great question. And, and I feel there's, there's, you know, in my mind, there's, there's two levels to it. One is on the organizational level, which is a lot around how do we develop practices and structures that allow us to cope with it? Um, so for example, very simple things, right? So in the weekly meeting, asking something like, what surprised you last week? It's a very simple question, but what it does is, that people bring up things that question their assumptions. So someone might say, it really surprised me last week that farmers used our washing machine differently. And when you do this, what you, what you do is you legitimize the unexpected as a part of your processes and you legitimize it as something that people should look out for. And there's actually quite some research around how that once you ask people to look out for the unexpected, the positively unexpected especially, they start to see it more. It's like when you start looking for money in the street. I find a lot of money in the street because I expect it to be there. Mostly pennies, unfortunately, so it doesn't really change my lifestyle, but people drop a lot of money. So once you open your eyes to it, it tends to happen more often. And so the way we can do that in organizations is to have practices like what surprised you last week, asking that in the weekly meeting, performance reviews, and so on to, to, to get people into the modus of nothing is taken for granted, everything can change, and that's okay because that's part of our uh, culture. 
I think more importantly, though, on, and by the way, another practice, just um, for the sake of that, it's one of my absolute favorites, is the project funeral. And, you know, because usually in companies, when something didn't work out, uh, we try to hide it, right? Because we don't want to be the loser, the failure yeah. who messed it up. And so that's the problem because most of the learning and, and, and the trust comes from things that didn't work out, right? And so the project funeral is about saying things that didn't work out get laid to rest in front of people from other divisions or other parts of the organization, and then people reflect on what didn't work. And so instead of celebrating failure, it's about celebrating the learning from what didn't work. And so in this one example, uh, a project manager, you know, laid it to rest, the project he was working on, it's a window glass. It's an amazing technology that doesn't reflect the light, but, you know, he laid it to rest and said, look, we learned that the market wasn't big enough for this. So here we put it to rest. Someone in the audience goes like, hey, 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 have you considered what this could mean for solar? Have you considered if you take that technology into a solar context, how much energy that could absorb? And that's how, quote unquote, serendipitously part of their solar division emerged in, in their company that became a, a great a part of it. And so the point here is that they created a culture and a process that allows people to help to connect the dots for each other and, you know, create that trust in the process. So that's kind of a lot of practices there on the on the on the on the organization level we can think about depending on how much trust there is already between employees. On the individual level, I'm a big fan of reframing ourselves and our minds towards thinking about how do I connect dots most of the time. So in terms of, you know, my wife, you know, most people will probably say that about my wife, but in my case, it's absolutely true. She is the most amazing woman in the world. And she sure. essentially is the perfect dot connector. She is, when you look at her, you know, she's constantly connecting dots. And one of the things she does really well is whenever you would tell her something, she would think about one thing like, can I make one introduction or can I contribute one idea? And by just kind of having this open mindset of saying, whenever I have a conversation that's professional in some way or the other, is there one thing I can do for the other person? And by doing this, what happens is the brain reframes towards seeing dots everywhere and you start right. connecting them. Um, but also, and, and you know, there's a lot of practices, but just a second one, because I love it so much, um, is the, the hook strategy. And the hook strategy is about saying that when... It's serendipity is not only about making accidents meaningful, like we just talked about, where you can reframe situations and so on in a lot of different ways and imbue meaning in it, but also uh, it is about how do you create more meaningful accidents. Mm -hmm. And so the hook strategy is about saying, if you sit back and think about what are a couple of things in your life you're curious about at the moment. I'm curious about how I can decrease poverty in uh, due to education in Nicaragua, right? Something like this, where you say it's very concrete things uh, that you're curious about, writing two or three of them down, and then integrating them into every conversation in some way or the other. Someone who does that really well is Oli Barrett, uh, an entrepreneur in London. If you would ask him this kind of what do you do question, right, at a conference or wherever you go, he wouldn't just say, I'm a technology entrepreneur. He would say, I'm a technology entrepreneur, recently started reading into the philosophy of science, but what I'm really excited about is playing the piano. And so what he's doing here is he's giving you three potential hooks where you could be like, oh my God, such a coincidence, we're hosting piano sessions, you should stop by. Oh my God, such a coincidence, my sister is teaching on the philosophy of science, you should give a guest lecture. The point is the more we put these anchors out there, especially also with people we know, we can't know their social capital, we can't know whom they know, and so it's really kind of one of these ways where then people start connecting the dots and your next kind of social innovation or so will come from someone from the most unexpected of places. This is absolutely fantastic. I can spend hours speaking with you. <laughs> Thank you, Kristen, for this. Because, uh, you know, as we build more into the future and as we get more, much more into, into, the, into the future, you know, I, I, we, we've been working on resilience, we've been working on diversity, we've, we've been working on leadership and... Um, Recently, I figured that that you know all that we need to create a more sustainable world, which implies you know resilience, diversity, inclusion, of course, and being much more aware about what's happening around, including meditation, including you know focuses on the present moment, and providing with all the points that you you told us. Um, I'm, I'm I'm always trying you know to 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 figure out what's the next thing. Um, because I believe that it's only by connecting all the dots to build a resilient and, and, and responsive organization. So what do we need more? Because as you mentioned, you know, a lot of women are capable to connect the dots. A lot of people actually, you know, no, no gender. Um, but it, it's what's the magic to face the uncertainty? And, you know, to I often say that 
what what success is is after failing knowing how to reboost and to get up so what is here the secret sauce to to get back on our feet after you know having those those uh those struggles yeah well that's really interesting i mean it reminds me a lot you know i had two near death experiences in life and, and a couple of situations where you know you in a way need to decide does the situation define me or do i try to define a little bit of the situation and it's hard right because in the moment emotionally it's like oh my god like life is over and you know my last near-death experience was two years ago um covid i had a severe form of it and what happened actually what came out of it it's a long story but what came out of it was essentially my wife and and my baby girl and and so it's kind of you know when 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 bad luck in a way becomes the inflection point it becomes the, the starting point for something that becomes serendipitous and you know when you speak with um, people and, and our research shows that a lot that a lot of times people who did kind of things in the world that we would consider inspiring they at some point had an inflection point something that went really bad and that actually over time then developed into something where kind of it defined them but they also defined it and they made it kind of like something that that, that governed them and so i found it always fascinating um to think about what is the um, it's really Viktor Frankl, right? Um, that uh, Viktor Frankl, if you would um, speak with him, you know, he is one of the, you know, when people ask who would you love to have a dinner conversation with, uh, Viktor Frankl is, is one of them. Um, um, and, and one of the kind of key things that, that he um, was excited about was this question, how do you imbue meaning in every situation, especially when things go wrong? And so one thing I do all the time is to try to figure out when someone goes, something goes wrong, right? What is there still some kind of meaning in there? Is there something good that could out of it? A breakup with someone, yes, it feels like the end of the world, but maybe that opens the door to meeting the person you're really supposed to be with. Or a breakdown in a relationship with a business partner might actually then open up to redesign the business model, things like this, right? And so the first thing is, I think, to your point, the kind of reframing piece and 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 it's hard. Um, and and it's it's we could talk more. A lot of our research is in context of poverty, where people are extremely good at reframing. Uh, all the time but i think the second point i i'm much more interested in also at the moment which is what are the kind of the, the self-limiting beliefs we all have that hold us back from having more of it because you know a lot of times we might be in a meeting and have that unexpected idea but not bring it up or we might be in that coffee shop situation but not speak with a person or we might be at a conference and not speak with that speaker even though we had that amazing idea we wanted to share with them and so there's these kind of you know things like fear of rejection imposter syndrome things like this that are deep underlying self-limiting beliefs and so i've become a big fan of really starting with this of writing down what are the incidences in my life where serendipity could have happened but it didn't and then identifying what is the pattern behind it and if it is something like fear of rejection right in my case that, that used to be the case where then um, one of the reframings was around, okay, what's the worst thing that can happen? I always thought the worst thing that can happen is that the, the sting of rejection, right? So that, that someone says, I don't have time for you. I don't want to speak with you, whatever it is. Yeah, that's a short sting, but the real, real pain is the regret that you feel if you didn't do it, right? That, that you walk outside the coffee shop and you think, ah, what could have happened had I spoken with a person that you go out of this meeting and think, ah, what could have happened had I brought up that idea. And so reframing away from what's the worst thing that happens if I do it to what's the worst thing that happens if I don't do it. To me, there was a big shift because now kind of, yes, sometimes it feels like fearful, but also, you know what, we only have one life at this point as, as much as we know. Right. And so we might as well make the best of it. And, and so I think that's kind of, um, to me, the bigger question, there's a lot of practices we can do to reframe and so on. But I think that like analyzing oneself first, like I feel that's that's one of the first steps it, to. It's, it's really important that Evan is such a channel to, to mention that because we, I mean, we both made a lot of leaders, uh, a lot of organizations, as you mentioned, at the individual level, when everything falls apart, like now, uh, you know, with the crisis and a lot of dramas around, um, I still believe that to create social innovation, it comes from the bottom up. And, you know, there is a book that I'm recommending also, um, that, you know, it's, it's, it's called uh, Whatever You Think, Think the Opposite by Paul Harden. And, you know, it's always the case. It's a very small book, but it, 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 it provides exactly what you say. It's, a, it's, it, it's take the perspective, take two steps back, you know, to see what's going on. Um, you know, without emotions, of course, uh, removing, you know, all the aspects that can be really, really connected to something that is emotional inside. Uh, and, and, you know, to foster 
particularly to, to foster resilience and, ser and, and, and serendipity and to be, you know, really aware about how to build, uh, you know, a sustainable world, we need those two connections. We need to be aware. We need to, to believe in, in, in the team that we are involved with. And, uh, and, and, and when it comes, you know, to, to create something new or to pursue a goal, it's really important to, to have that line. And unfortunately, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm still trying, you know, to, to figure out what, what's the next thing. Um, and I think that the next thing is going to be from us. It's going to cre be created by us. Um, because we're building those social innovations hub, we, we're building all together, you know, um, the community and, and around. And what would be, um, I mean, a few tips that you, you, can, you can provide, you know, to the audience you know, the, 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 the switches, what do we need, you know, as switches to, to, to be connected, more connected to, to whatever is happening so we, we can solve more problems? Mm. I love that question because it, it reminds me a lot. Uh, you know, I do a lot of work in, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa and, and uh, especially in Kenya and, and, and parts of South Africa. And uh, I will never forget the first time I started working uh, in, 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 in that context where I, you know, came in and, and I asked them, uh, what is the one thing that I should never ask you uh, that people ask you usually when they come into your context and, you know, usually kind of obviously white guys coming into the context of, of, of non-whites and, and, and what do they ask you that, that, that I should never ask you. And so they said, well, never ask us what we need at the first question, because if you ask us what we need, you put us in the role of the victim or the beneficiary of someone who needs your benevolence. Whereas if you come in and say, what's already here and how can we make the best of it? then we can start on the same level and we can still talk about resourcing. We can still talk about all these other things, but it's actually about respecting that we want to create our own luck. We want to have the dignity to, to solve problems ourselves. And to me, that was a big shift, right? Away from thinking about resourcing, thinking about like centralized, you know, but to, but to your point, like going to the more local level. And then, you know, to me, the biggest shift was observing how they operate. And so this organization is called uh, Reconstructed Living Labs. Um, it's based in the Cape Flats in Cape Town. It's a, a very rough community that they live in, in terms of you know high crime rates, high poverty, and, and so on. And so they came out of the local community and said, okay, we will try to help people create enterprises so that they can grow out of poverty. So they did very simple things like five steps or 10 steps to use social media to build a business or things like this. And then they go into other local communities. And instead of asking, what do you need? They ask, what's already here and how can we make the best of it? There's a former drug dealer, fantastic. That person will have amazing social capital. That person will be very resourceful and very creative. And if we can turn them into a teacher, then you can turn your community around because that's the cool kid. That's the person that people want to kind of, um, you know, like, like uh, see as, as, as succeeding. And so they look at an old garage, they see a training center. And so that's where a lot of the connecting the dots happens, where in a way we're saying, instead of just thinking about budget constraints and what we don't have, we think about what's already here, especially with those people we might underestimate, we, with those people who might be, quote unquote, less kind of educated or, or, or things like that. And, and actually seeing them as people who want to create their own luck, who want to have meaning, but then kind of giving them a platform to actually do that. And to me, that is the biggest point that I think so many development efforts are failing because there's so much effort on like creating luck for people versus actually saying, no, people want to create their own luck. If I'm the father or the mother of a child and I'm a development organization that gives them money to educate or to nourish them, you feel like a failure. You feel I wasn't able to do that myself versus if you create a job for them where then they can pay education, then they feel, oh, like I'm the parent who actually did something meaningful for my kids. And so I think it's, it's that kind of shift of, of saying, who are the people who truly need to create their own luck and how do we give them the tools to do that? It's super important. And thank you for mentioning that because uh, I've been involved in many, many discussions also with the Grameen Bank back in time. Um, and, and, it's, uh, and it's kind of fantastic. Thank you so much for this. Um, please, one more point about um, where can we find you and, and, and you know, we have a community. Uh, a lot of subscribers, many, many people are following and, and, and so on. Um, a few tips, how can we practice all, this, all these good things? It's a great question. I'm a big fan of, of, of baby steps, of not saying, oh my God, we have to change everything at once. 
but rather to say, what are small things I can do in my day-to-day -day life to more and more do of it? So for example, how can I, instead of asking questions like, what do you do? Ask questions like, what do you enjoy doing? What it does is very simply, it gets people out of the autopilot of I do this, I am this professional X, Y, Z to what are the real common denominators? You might love something that is completely unexpected to me, but we then kind of connect over that. And so it's really kind of, um, you know, asking more open-ended questions that open up that opportunity space. Um, so you, with questions, right? Like, um, what do you enjoy doing? Or what did you find most interesting about this presentation or, or things like this, no that, that we learn more about the person. Um, yeah. Exactly. Um, a second one, I'm a really big fan of trying to figure out what are my key curiosities at the moment. Um, it doesn't have to be a passion or purpose. I think there's a lot of pressure on find your passion, find your purpose. No, it can be key curiosities. It can be, I would love to learn more about how I can um, work with kids in a refugee camp to make them feel um, that life is still worthwhile, right? It can be curiosities. But then what it does is I can build a couple of hooks and then kind of try to find some communities where I can cast these hooks and then people come to me, right? Because they, they, they say, oh, that's interesting. I'm also interested in exactly that question. And I didn't even know someone else might be interested in this as well. And so it's those kind of small things that, that I find really interesting. And you know, one thing that I found really fascinating, um, so when I started this work for, for the Serendipity Mindset, the, the book that kind of summarizes it all um, and, and Connect the Dots, which is the paperback, like I still remember, um, you know, a, a colleague of mine at the LSE where I used to teach earlier, um, he, he came to me and he was like, Christian, I love you. I love your work. I love your ideas, but I don't need more serendipity in my life. I have enough, like, you know, I have, I have a good life and I have like everything. Why would I need this? And so we made a deal and we said, you know what? Do a couple of things differently, like ask slightly different questions, um, you know, speak slightly differently with people and, and so on. And then let's reconnect. Now he comes back after a few weeks and he's like, Christian, I didn't know life can be so joyful. And, you know, to me, that was a big shift in thinking that I always thought that work would mostly be for people like us who intuitively cultivate a lot of serendipity already, who connect the dots intuitively and then gives them a vocabulary for it, gives them legitimacy for it. And then they can communicate that it's actually more proactive than people think what, what this is doing. But actually, that's a group that's fun. And I think people can learn more exercises and so on. So I think that's a great, uh, great group. But actually, the real big impact happens with people like my former colleague who didn't believe in it at all, who didn't believe they can quote unquote, create their own luck. Then they start small, but then it gets more and more. And then it's almost like an addiction where you're like, oh my God, like this is a life change now. Yeah. And that's the same in organizations. I mean, I work a lot with organizations around social innovation and innovation. And, you know, those organizations that are more traditional, it takes longer to kind of say, okay, let's start a couple of things. But once they start, the kind of fear of, oh my God, change goes into the, the kind of excitement of actually, this doesn't mean that everything goes down. It just means that we do things a little bit differently. So I think there's a lot of excitement around this. So I think wow. to wrap this up, you know, my, my key learning from all of this is, and, and I think also why I enjoyed uh, talking with you so much, I feel you, you, you embody a lot of um, yeah. the kind of serendipity <laughs> mindset, which is really, you know, philosophically speaking, what's really behind a lot of the things we talked about is, is Goethe. You know, Goethe, he, he wrote these beautiful um, uh, poems and, and, and things, and he had this beautiful idea that if you take someone as they are, you make them worse. But if you take them as who they could be, you make them capable of becoming who they can be. And, 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 and that's what serendipity is really about, right? Serendipity is about potentiality. It's about what could someone become? It's about what could be a situation. And it's about what could the world be if we actually become more responsible about it and, and, and really go that sustainable path that, that you're talking about. So I think it's, it's really exciting to, to think about this in terms of there's so much potentiality out there and it's up to us to, to do something with it. Um, I think the, the, the key to unlock, uh, one of the keys to unlock um, sustainability and build more resilience and efficiency goes by serendipity, of course, and connecting the dots. Thank you so much. I highly appreciate it. Uh, we have a link, right? Yes, yeah, serendipitymindset.com. Yeah. So the serendipity mindset and connect the dots by Christian Bush. Thank you so much. Thank you.